Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah 32 if you have one. And Merry Christmas to you. It is so good to see you. And it's good that I barely made it down from the baptistry into the worship center. So, got it in here. Isaiah 32 is where we are today. Today's message is entitled, A Manger and a Messiah. A Manger and a Messiah. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Christmas morning to come here and to celebrate the reason for the season. And that is the birth of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 32, beginning in verse 1. Behold, a king will reign in righteousness, and princes will rule in justice. Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Then the eyes of those who will see will not be closed, and the ears of those who will hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammers will hasten to speak distinctly. The fool will no more be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with iniquity to practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. As for the scoundrel, his devices are evil. He plans wicked schemes to ruin the poor with lying words, even when the plea of the needy is right. But he who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. Well, praise the Lord for the reading of his word. Um, This Christmas season, what we've been doing as a church family, rather than reflecting back on the writings of Luke, we've been focusing more on projecting forward from the writings of Isaiah And that's what we're doing today as well, as we're looking forward to this prophetic word from Isaiah, written 2,700 years before the birth of Jesus the Christ. Sometimes when we look at a picture, I don't know about you, but I can see immediately what the point of it is. But there are other times when I look and I don't see what was there at all. Any of you ever watch the Where's Waldo books? You know what I'm talking about? Now, are you good at the Where's Waldo books? Some of you, I am terrible at that stuff. And some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. And you need to go and see what's up. But uh, sometimes a picture is really clear and other times it's fuzzy, is my point. Um, Sometimes we look at a picture, the longer we look, the more we see. And other times what we see at first isn't there at all. And Isaiah 32 is kind of like that. Uh, At first, this chapter seems to be another prophetic word about the long line of kings. But I I think it's really clear uh, as you focus in on Isaiah 32 that this is not just talking about any line of kings, but it's talking about the true king of kings. That's what it's talking about. It's talking about the eventual birth of Jesus. And uh, we celebrate that today. And um, It must be God's revelation through the divine presence of Jesus Christ that we see that this is written. Uh, Isaiah was an instrument that was being used under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. And so I think it's really important for us to remember that when we read the Bible, that the Bible was written by man, but the Holy Spirit used man. So the Holy Spirit used people like Isaiah to divinely write the Bible. That's how he knew. You might wonder, was he Nostradamus or something? Was he able to just predict things into the future? He was much more than Nostradamus because he had the Holy Spirit using his mind, using his pen to write down the supernatural. And Isaiah was an instrument under the inspiration of God. And he said a coming human personality would make the ultimate difference. When you look at verse 2 of Isaiah 32, uh, it says, Each will be like a hiding place from the wind, a shelter from the storm, like streams of water in a dry place, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. And it was given to Isaiah to speak of Emmanuel in chapter 7. In chapter 9, we can see the four primary names of God that are given in the projection of the coming Messiah. And uh, this is God's revelation through the human personality of Jesus of Nazareth. 
And the ultimate protective, creative, preservative force in mankind's history will not be an impersonal force, but will be God's revelation through a human personality. And it took vision for Isaiah to see uh, all of this. It took him courage to say all of this. And so the point of, point of what I'm saying is Isaiah 32, when it mentions that word king, that is talking about the coming king, Jesus, the king of kings. Okay? So Isaiah 32 is a prophetic word about the coming king of kings. That's why it's important that we look at it on Christmas morning. Uh, Isaiah's world really was kind of like ours. It was dominated by impersonal forces that were beyond people's grasp. Now, we have a bunch of children in here today, and uh, I don't know about you, but my kids, sometimes what they do is beyond my grasp of ability to help with them. And I think one of the most beautiful sounds in a church is the sound of, of children, and our church is blessed to have a lot of children. For the, for the number of people who attend our church, the number of children who attend is vastly higher than the average church. And that's, a, that's a sign of great health in a church. But Isaiah, he had a problem that he couldn't control everything. And uh, I can't control everything as the pastor of this church. And uh, you can't control everything as a parent or a grandparent. And uh, anyway, Isaiah's world was like ours, dominated by impersonal forces beyond his grasp. Now, what Isaiah had going where he couldn't control things is he had the Assyrians that were coming in from the north. Then he had the Egyptians that were coming in from the south. And they were dealing with quite an issue of infiltrators coming into the land of Israel. Yet Isaiah had the wisdom to see and the courage to say that the ultimate significant difference in every man's life and in the life of mankind will not be impersonal forces, but God's revelation through a king who will be the shadow of a great rock, it says in verse 2. Here's the deal. Some of you have impersonal forces, stuff that's beyond your control, stuff that you cannot control whatsoever, and you worry about them way too much. Isaiah had a lot of stuff coming at him as a leader in Israel, and he was able to move past all of that to focus on the coming Jesus. We can move past all of the extra stuff that we have in our lives and focus on the coming Jesus. Now, it says, like I just said a moment ago, God's self-revelation through a king who will be the shadow of a great rock. You see that at the end of verse 2? Like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Uh, This is also true of Christmas in 2022. If individuals in our congregation are despairing, it's because we've decided we are victims of forces that determine our destiny in this Christmas season instead of looking at the greatest reason for all. I want you to know what I said to the church two nights ago. My heart hurts and breaks, especially and specifically for widows and widowers at Christmas time. For those of you who have lost a loved one this Christmas, my heart hurts for you. But I have great news of hope that Jesus was literally born of the Virgin Mary, and He is God, He reigns upon the throne, and He is here to comfort you in a time of need. Does that comfort you? Going through all kinds of stuff you've gone through this year? Jesus is real, and He's here. Let's move on for the sake of time to point number one. The incarnate human personality made the ultimate difference in the lives of humanity. I'm talking about Jesus makes a big difference in your life. He does. Isaiah says in the middle of verse 2, like streams of water in a dry place. Now, wherever you find hope instead of despair, wherever you find creativity instead of stagnation, wherever you find justice instead of brutality, it's because in some way, that place has been touched by the coming king that Isaiah saw. 
When it says that there was a rock there in verse 2, there are several ways we can look at this rock. One way is that it was a rock of protection. Verse 2 concludes by saying, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. Now, men whose eyes myopically are fastened on what immediately is before them, Isaiah said the human personality of Jesus, the incarnate Savior, would be the ultimate stimulation of human history and the ultimate preservation. And that's what he meant in the end of that verse. Now, such a shadow was very important in the desert. It protected them from the Sirocco wind. A Sirocco wind is a very heavy wind that would come from the east and it would pick up sand and it would throw it in people's faces. You ever seen pictures of people that are out in the desert and they're wearing guards over their faces and you wonder what is the deal with that? The reason for that in the Middle East is because of what's called a Sirocco wind. Jonah chapter 4, Jonah experienced that exact kind of wind coming at him when he was throwing his pity party. But uh, the rock of protection where it says in verse 2, like the shade of a great rock in a weary land. That rock is a rock of protection. God protects you in the midst of weariness. He protects you in the midst of weariness. Also, it's a rock of preservation. The rock is not only a rock of protection, but it's a rock that preserves. In that desert land where where a rock reared itself up, on the leeward side of that rock, in its shadow, things could actually grow. Now, if you took a look at something that is a real thing, an an oasis in the midst of the desert, when you looked at an oasis, you would always see that there are rocks present in the oasis. You might say, well, why is that? The reason for that is because on its leeward side, fragile green things can grow because the rock arrests the drift of the air. And Jesus Christ is the only rock that arrests the drift of my life and of yours. And without it, every oasis would be consumed and we would live in a weary land of spiritual emptiness and weariness. Jesus is a rock of preservation. Now I'm going to say something that at first you might disagree with and I want you just to stick with me for a moment. But he's also a rock of division. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought that Jesus was the the ultimate unity. I mean, John 17 is there where it says, just as Jesus and the Father are one, so should we be one. So how could we say that he is a rock of division? Well, like I said, just stick with me. Look at Isaiah 28, verse 16. If you just flip over to Isaiah 28, it speaks of the coming Messiah as a rock. And it says this, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am the one who has laid as a foundation in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone of a sure foundation, And whoever believes will not be in haste. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to go to on a mission trip right outside of Banff in Alberta, Canada. Now, that's in the Canadian Rockies. And I know I was really suffering for Jesus having to go to the Canadian Rockies, but that's where I went. And I'm telling you, there's a great work of God happening in the Calgary area of Alberta right now. Several churches are really thriving there, and uh, it's great to see what the Holy Spirit has been doing. But uh, I went up there, and I learned about a place called Divide Creek. There is a place outside of Banff, Colorado, in the Canadian Rockies called Divide Creek. And in the midst of that creek, there is a rock, a huge rock, right? So I want you to picture the beautiful Canadian Rockies, a big creek, not quite a river, but a creek and a huge rock right in the midst of that creek. All right. And I learned about this place when I was up there and I wish I could have actually seen it with my own eyes. But where that rock takes center stage, all of the waters that run to the left of that rock eventually go to the Running Horse River, and then the waters flow into the Pacific Ocean. All the waters that flow to the right 
of Divide Rock uh, and Divide Creek. They eventually flow into the Bull River, then into the Saskatchewan River, then the Nelson River, then the Hudson Bay, and then into the Atlantic Ocean. You see, it's where the waters hit the rock and their eventual destinies are found. The dividing difference is the rock. And after striking it, the destinies of all those waters are determined. And Christmas time reminds of the revelation of God in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. St. Augustine said this, God became man not by losing what he was, but by assuming what he had never been. And in Christ incarnate, there is a dividing rock. Men's lives by falling to the left or the right of him are settled forever in their destinies. And I want you to hear me right now because I know some of you who are in here today are here with family. You're not used to coming to church very often. And I want you to hear this very, very clearly. I believe, and this is based upon Luke chapter 16. I believe that for people who die and don't know Jesus, that they go to hell. And that when they go to hell, I believe, and Luke 16 teaches this, I believe that there's essentially, it's like a DVD. You know how a DVD player, if you remember what a DVD player is? You remember how they just, they can go on rotation and play the same thing over and on a loop, over and over and over. I believe that when somebody is in hell, in Luke 16, that they remember the times when the gospel was shared to them and they are reminded of that over and over and over as a form of torture. Right now, I'm going to share the gospel with you. And the gospel is this, that Jesus Christ is the one true God. He lived perfect, a perfect 33 years on this earth. He died on the cross to forgive you of your sins. And the only way to go to heaven is by confessing that Jesus is Lord, giving your life to him and receiving him as your new life. That's the only way that you go to heaven. And I believe that if you deny Christ, the, the, proverbial, the proverbial dividing rock in your life, you are choosing to go down the wrong waters when you could choose to go down the right waters today. And before you leave this room today, I want you to give your life to Christ. You say, that's very heavy for a Sunday morning on Christmas. I know that, but I'd rather you hear the gospel than you leave here today having had some sugar coating on your heart. So there was a rock of division. There was a rock of preservation. There was a rock of protection. And all of this is enveloped with the incarnate human personality that made the ultimate difference in the lives of humanity. Jesus can make the ultimate difference in your life. Secondly and lastly, the incarnate human personality made the spiritual difference in the lives of humanity. Look at verses 3 and 4. Then the eyes of those who see will not be closed, and the ears of those who hear will give attention. The heart of the hasty will understand and know, and the tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. So there is a renewed spiritual reception that's given here. A renewed spiritual reception. And he speaks of this under the impact of the coming king, the coming Messiah, that he prophesies here in Isaiah 32. He'll give men a new capacity for spiritual reception. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dimmed. The eyes of him that hear will really hear. And Isaiah has the burden to preach to a congregation where all who are spiritually blind would eventually become spiritually bright with eyesight. Today, you can make a decision to give your life to Christ and have spiritual sight. To go from being spiritually blind to being spiritually insightful. There's also a renewed perception. You can see that in the beginning of verse 4. The heart of the hasty will understand and know. Hasty here means the obscure, the confused, the unlikely. And suddenly... The reckless, the, the, the people who see the coming king, they will leap to new understanding. The heart of the hasty will then understand and know. The people who have reckless hearts 
will then be able to have hearts that are completely fulfilled in Christ. I want you to think about Luke chapters 1 and 2 for a moment. Other than the obscure, unheralded people like Elizabeth and Zechariah suddenly began to speak the profoundest things, men had never spoken those sorts of profound things before. See, Isaiah 32, 4 was fulfilled in the lives of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Or you think about this, an unwed teenage child becoming a mother, a peasant girl named Mary, she suddenly spoke with beautiful eloquence. She spoke the words of the Magnificat. Or think about an aged Simeon who should have been at the age of senility at that point. He was saying profound, profound things about the change of history before his very eyes. There was a renewed spiritual perception. Also, a renewed spiritual communication. You can see this at the end of verse 4. The end of verse 4, it says, The tongue of the stammerers will hasten to speak distinctly. That means that once you receive Christ as your Savior, once you give your life over to the coming King that was prophesied in Isaiah 32, that all of a sudden you will be able to communicate that truth to other people. Now, I'm not saying you have to wax eloquently as one of the great preachers of all time or anything like that, but you'll be able to communicate that Jesus Christ is the one true God when you give your life over to Jesus. And that's a beautiful truth. My eight-year-old daughter preached the gospel today by being baptized. That's in fulfillment of Isaiah 32.4. Verses 5 through 6 of Isaiah 32, it says, The fool will no more be called noble, nor the scoundrel said to be honorable. For the fool speaks folly, and his heart is busy with iniquity, to practice ungodliness, to utter error concerning the Lord, to leave the craving of the hungry unsatisfied, and to deprive the thirsty of drink. What that means is that bad men are going to look even worse when they deny Christ. That's the dark side of Christmas. You think about people like Herod. Now, Herod, Herod was a bad dude. That's what it says in the Greek, right? Herod was a bad dude. He was. He was a bad mamma jamma. All right? Kids, turn to somebody near you and say, Herod was a bad mamma jamma. Yeah, I like that. He was a bad mamma jamma. You say, well, what was so bad about Herod besides, of course, what happened at Christmas time when he wanted all those babies killed? Well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background about him as we're wrapping up the sermon. He was married 10 times. He murdered at least one of his own wives. He murdered some of his children. When Herod died, he wanted one person in every Judean village to be murdered so people all over Judea would be crying when they heard of his death. Herod, however, never looks worse than when he is beside that manger in Bethlehem. And it was in response to that that he reaches his lowest point. And by our inward spiritual response to that coming king, that our worst will be at its worst, our character will be called what it really is. Verse 8 of Isaiah 32, it says, But... He who is noble plans noble things, and on noble things he stands. So what is bad in all of us will be its worst. What's best in all of us will be our best. Integrity is shown, for example, in the life of Joseph, Jesus' stepfather. Joseph received that incredible message that he was not compromised by Mary, but the thing that was in her womb was from God himself. When did purity ever look purer? But coming to that manger, we also see Isaiah 32, 8 fulfilled in the life of Herod when he wanted to murder all of those little children. (coughs) I want to close out just by reminding you of this. Why did Jesus come as a baby? 
And stick with me as we're closing out the service. He didn't come to overthrow Rome or he would have come on a war horse. He didn't come to raise the standard of living or he would have come in a king's carriage. He didn't come to educate or he would have brought degrees and books. Jesus was born to meet our need of a Savior and to save us from our sins. That's why he came. And we're going to have one more song. And I want to encourage you that as we sing this song, that you would sing that Christmas carol with all of your heart. And I'm going to be standing down here. And if you want to come down and pray with me about giving your life to Christ, then you come down and you do that. Others of you, you have a loved one and you just want to pray for them this Christmas season. I want you to know the altar is open, open for you to pray. I'll be down here to pray with you, other ministers as well. But you, you take this time this Christmas morning to pray together. Stand up with me as I pray a brief prayer and then you come forward and make a decision for the Lord. Lord, we pray that anybody in here today who needs to make a decision for you, that they would do it right now. That they would say, you know what, I'm at that dividing rock of my life. I need to give my life to Jesus. We pray that would be done right now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.